The Blitz spirit describes a specific archetype or way of life that came out of a certain period of British history. There is no doubt that there were some great examples of people exhibiting Blitz spirit, but was this really the case for the whole nation? Did everyone really pull up their socks and endure? Today I want to explore the myth of the Blitz spirit and ask whether this concept was real and if it really applied to everybody. The Blitz itself describes a period from the 7th of September of 1940 to the 11th of May in 1941, when German planes dropped 32,000 tonnes of bombs on British cities across the nation, with London taking the most damage. Many houses, workplaces and communities were destroyed, and a reported 45,000 people were killed. As the nation finds itself in crisis, a strong sense of resilience grew, and this feeling got people through terrible and trying times. Even with many parts of the city decimated, somehow people were still hopeful. In fact, 97% of Londoners still continued to believe that they would win the war in the end. And everyday life generally continued on, with a few major adjustments. It's even said that people would compare bad days to weather, it being very blitzy out today. So life endured, because it had to, and there was little choice to do anything else. Right from the beginning of the war, safety procedures were put in place for the home front, with the fear that civilian bombings would occur. However, even in the darkest days of the Blitz, not everyone willingly accepted these new safety measures. There were many instances of complaints, objections and refusing to follow orders. Blackout measures, for example, were the biggest source of these, and enforcers of this new law were extremely unpopular. This required the minimising of outdoor light to prevent overhead bombers from targeting large cities and population centres. So blocking the windows and doors with the blackout material, having street lights and vehicle headlights off or deflected downward. This was seen as the worst disruption to everyday life and hefty fines were handed out when not following these rules. On top of this, the darkness also enabled more crime to pick up. Looting specifically was a big thing, bombed and abandoned buildings being the main targets, but shops were also targeted under the cover of darkness. For these so-called bomb chasers, there wasn't much the police could do to guard these destroyed buildings. It was said that shopkeepers lost more from looting than they did from damage from the bombs themselves. Now, looting abandoned bomb-damaged homes was not too immoral, but it really crossed the line when, during air raids when people were sheltered in public shelters, burglars took the opportunity to raid their undefended houses for valuables. In fact, it's no wonder that theft rates rose, as many criminals serving less than three months in prison were released when war was announced in 1939, and when caught, most small charges were given higher fines rather than locking them up in prison. Assault cases also rose under the cover of darkness. Many managed to get away with a lot more. We've all heard of Jack the Ripper, but have you heard of the Blackout Ripper? George Cummins was found guilty of a murder spree using the blackouts to commit crimes and move under the cover of darkness. And there were reports of murderers moving their victims' bodies close to bombed houses in order to stage the death as an accident, such as Harriet Dobkin, who was found guilty in 1943 of murdering his wife and then trying to hide her in the wreckage of a chapel. But it wasn't just the criminals getting on in these illegal activities. The government paid out compensation to those who had lost their homes, and a fair number of people, like a Walker Handy, had claimed from the fund 19 times over five months, but was eventually found out after receiving over £5,000 in compensation. Some men who didn't want to be enlisted would pay off doctors or hire a substitute to get them off of the service papers. Businesses with essential services to the government also hiked their own prices up, taking advantage of the desperation many found themselves in. And though shelters were free, they could get especially crowded, and some would take up the prime spot and sell them off to the highest bidder. The largest amount of new crime came from rationing charges, and namely from people who had never considered themselves criminals. As rationing was introduced, many items became luxury or illegal goods. 
Because of this, a black market was created for people just looking for some home comforts or ways to satisfy their families. By the end of the war in 1945, more than 114,000 prosecutions for the black market activities were issued. Some even found ways to manoeuvre the rationing system, even if it meant just happening across more rationing coupons than you were permitted. That was a crime against your fellow neighbours who had to settle for the allotted amount. One woman was fined £160 in today's money in 1940 for using one extra ration book after her son was accidentally sent to two. Some were using ration books from previously deceased people, or even swapping rations with neighbours for money or other goods. Despite this so-called blitz spirit, the crime rate on the home front raised 57% during the war. Another myth of the blitz spirit was the saying, we're all in this together, or we can all conquer this if we do it together. But were they really in it together? Was every person treated as equally in the same boat, or having to sacrifice quite as much? As raids intensified, many children were evacuated during the war. They came commonly from London and populated cities, and were taken into the countryside. And it was much more common for poorer families and farmers to take in these poor children, but it was more difficult to get wealthier families in their manor homes to take in any evacuees. They described these children as savage, untrained animals, suggesting instead they, they be taken to camps. Class divides really became evident as the bombing worsened. The wealthy were able to escape to their holiday homes or hotels in the country, and even paying for access to luxury shelters around the city. Luxury meaning the general population were kept out. And after the dust had settled, it was a larger majority of the poorer lower classes who had lost everything. The wealthy, if anything, could easily replace anything that they had lost. Coming out of the war, the working classes felt a debt was owed to them and their suffering, especially after seeing how easily the upper classes all bounced back quite quickly. And in fact, this split spirit didn't necessarily have a we-are-all-in-this-together experience. Refugees, immigrants, and really anyone who looked or talked differently were suddenly seen as suspicious enemies, not to be trusted. Especially those fleeing Germany, who came to Britain only to be called Nazis themselves. One more clear message from the Blitz spirit was that people kept working and boosted production while their lives were still threatened. The evidence of people continuing their day, their chores, their work, is not proof of high morale, it's just doing everything you can to hang on to reality. In reality, compulsory work orders were made to keep up the production. You were required permission for time off and could not refuse work. There was an essential work order to help with the war effort. Even farmers, for example, in Durham, were fined for not growing the required two acres of potatoes for the war effort. This is not diminishing that production and work ethic did rise among the patriotic Brits, even more determined to win this war after it came full force into the very neighbourhoods. But the government certainly must have felt it necessary to ensure this hard work was shared across the board. The public were advised to shelter during air raids in domestic shelters, personal bunkers or public shelters like subway stations. However, these shelters were in short supply or unavailable to many. The East End was highly targeted during the Blitz, but also happens to be the most crowded and vulnerable. In the East End, just 40% had domestic shelters, which could count as broom cupboards and basements. Many lived in apartments, so there was no room to make a DIY bunker in the garden, and just 10% had access to public shelter spaces. Truth is the state was simply unable to quickly deal with the new necessities of dense urban populations. In one survey, only 51% of families that stayed in the city said that they did not or could not take shelter during the Blitz. The Blitz spirit in this way also masked some stubborn Brits at the centre of a very romanticised story. Keeping calm and carrying on didn't mean to completely ignore what was going on as many people actually did. On top of low supply of shelters, there were people who simply didn't want to take shelter. 
When the bombings began, at first it was chaotic, but at least most of the population were frightened enough to follow safety instructions and what shelter was available to them. After a few weeks and months, the novelty was wearing off. Sheltering wasn't compulsory, however highly and urgently advised. Solly Zuckerman conducted a survey in 1941 to discover why people weren't taking this seriously. Were they careless or arrogant, or did they simply not want this to affect their lives too much? But he found no clear explanation from the results. A popular thought seems to have been that fate had already decided. A bomb that killed you already had your name on it. So what was meant to be will be, and there's no point hiding from it. This idea was referred to in numerous eyewitness statements and diaries at this period. Numerous bodies found after a bombing were actually found in their bedrooms, sleeping out the raid, or even just on the street where they were going about their day, ignoring the sirens. It was not good to just be scared or to hide, but just to carry on going about life. And then there is ignorance, and then there is risk-taking. There are reports of games being played among young teens playing No Man's Land, dodging the bombs at night, or having viewing parties standing on roofs to watch the bombings across the city lines. And then there was patriotically claiming that hiding would have meant that Hitler had won, or one woman who reportedly covered her house in Union Jacks as targets for the bombers and sat proudly outside her front door waiting for them to dare attack her. Perhaps when it came to the Blitz spirit, others took it a little bit too seriously. The real Blitz spirit may have been a myth, but it was still the message that was shoved down people's throats. Newspapers, films and other media were highly censored to promote morale, like the film London Can Take It. The classic poster and term that epitomises this Blitz spirit is the Keep Calm and Carry On poster from 1939. This was a slogan created by the British government on the eve of World War II. They printed 2.5 million posters, however they were actually never used and eventually most were destroyed. It was only 55 years later that a book dealer discovered one surviving poster. The message was unearthed and brought back into the public eye for the 21st century. Such posters tried to keep up morale and wanted to convey reassurance in troubling times. They did use this similar poster, your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory, which works along the same lines. Such propaganda really demonstrates how it's your attitude during this war that will win it. Official morale reports were created by the government. No, not accurate representations of what was actually going on, but more for bolstering of pride. They used the words cheerful, highly confident, taking the bombing with a good heart. In fact, 76 days into the bombing, spirit was extremely good. Other more personal evidence of the time shows their fears, their concern for family, and the serious devastation of the bombings. And what about the effects of the Blitz on people living after the war was over? In a study from the city of Hull studying survivors from the bombings, Britons were experiencing trauma from this. Some experiencing minor shock symptoms, some severe long-term anxiety states. In fact, health officials were worried about an air raid shock epidemic. However, in 1940s, most ordinary people didn't know about mental health or how to seek help for it. So there was no wave of trauma patients or admissions into hospitals. But what came of the Blitz was fear. What came from that fear was endurance, survival, and the need to keep calm and carry on. There was no room for trauma when these people needed to survive, and so any psychological effects went untreated and often unreported. And if we have learned anything from history, just because something wasn't reported doesn't mean it wasn't happening. It was primarily shoved under the carpet, and the focus turned not to the bad effects of the situation, but the resolve and stoic nature of everybody who went through it. And that's what we have continued to glorify about this time. Not what they were feeling, but the mask that they were wearing. However, the Blitz spirit grew to describe far more than just this particular period. It now symbolises a message of resilience in the face of unexpected adversity. 
But comparing the Blitz and in turn the Blitz spirit with whatever we happen to be going through at the time also has to acknowledge that it's okay to struggle and it's okay not to be as badass as some of our ancestors. Overall, the Blitz spirit may embody a great deal of brave and resilient people. It also masks the human nature behind a terrible situation. Not everybody kept calm and not everybody wanted to carry on. Now, this is such a huge topic, but that's all for today's video in dispelling the myth of the Blitz spirit. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. Please check out some of my other videos and don't forget to subscribe whilst you're at it. Bye.